Chapter 13 Coordination I do not want or hope. I intend. The Insecurity Labyrinth No one and no thing can prevent you from reaching your goal once you have taken the path through the right door except yourself. In other words, only lack of faith and lack of confidence can hinder your progress. Lack of self-belief and lack of confidence are basically one and the same thing. Both undermine the effectiveness of inner intention and make outer intention practically impossible. Nothing you do when you are lacking in confidence will be done well. The more stressed you are about the need to do something well, the worse the result will be. Lack of self-belief, together with the tendency to exaggerate the complexity of challenges, leads to a state of extreme tension or feeling of being totally overwhelmed. The extreme feeling of being overwhelmed is caused by the initial tension squeezing in on itself. The outer importance you associate with your goal makes the desire to reach it excruciating or wearying, whereas inner importance makes you doubt your own ability. Together, this leads to feelings of insecurity. Insecurity tightens the grip of inner intention as hard as it can in its efforts to achieve the goal. Even without taking the impact of balanced forces into consideration, the effect of this intense grip is always the direct opposite of the original intention. The effort required to maintain several excess potentials at once takes up all your personal energy. You can see how many potentials are involved. Inner and outer importance, frustration, and the effort required to keep yourself in check and the situation under control. There just is not enough free energy to go round. It is no wonder people end up feeling inhibited and tense, which makes them clumsy and awkward and, in turn, causes them to tighten the grip of control even further. This is why people end up feeling overwhelmed, unable to move, or utter anything intelligible. When a person is in this state, it might appear as if their intention is being held in a vice, but, actually, once things get to this stage, intention is absent altogether. All the energy that would fuel intention has gone on maintaining excess potentials. Insecurity, in the form of anxiety and panic, is pure feed for pendulums. Panic generates prognoses that start but what if? When a person is feeling insecure, the prognosis is usually pessimistic in nature. In this case, energy is channeled into running negative scenarios around in your mind and worrying about them. This also uses up the energy of intention. The fact that the energy is being used up is not as bad as what the energy is being used for. Stress panic, and fear are all powerful generators of our worst expectations, which, as you know, do come true. Guilt feelings are another rich source of insecurity that blossom into a bouquet of inadequacy, inferiority, lameness, and worthlessness. What question can there be of any self-confidence with that array of feeling? Guilt and everything connected with it causes the meridians to narrow. At the same time, the energy of intention is only sufficient to motivate actions that are feeble, indecisive, and mediocre. If you have a propensity to indulge in feelings of guilt, there will always be manipulators around you like moths around a light bulb. Sensing your weakness, they assert themselves at your expense happily devouring your unprotected energy. They play constantly on your feeling of guilt while you endlessly explain and justify your behavior, deepening your insecurity even further. 
Insecurity creates a vicious circle. The stronger the importance and desire, the deeper the insecurity. The tighter the grip of control over yourself personally and the situation, the more intense your tension. The more you feel panic and anxiety, the more likely they are to become justified. Guilt eventually turns life into the wretched existence of the loser. In an attempt to find a way out of the labyrinth, people desperately try and acquire confidence. One way in which they do this is to launch an outright attack on the world. In a preemptive maneuver, they attempt to demonstrate their strength and hide their lack of confidence. People try and erect a wall of confidence by impacting the world with their head-on, vigorous decisiveness. This kind of approach takes a lot of energy, but the wall of confidence will keep on crumbling. The energy behind forceful impact is spent on creating excess potentials and resisting the alternative's flow. In any case, the approach inevitably leads to failure and the battle to construct a wall of confidence starts all over again. Another way of trying to acquire confidence is not to bother building a foundation for confidence, but simply to put everything at stake. This kind of self-confidence is the same sheepish manner turned inside out. It is a way of creating the impression of something that is not really there. If confidence is not based on anything, it generates excess potential. But excess potential is not the only problem. You usually end up injuring someone else's interests when you act in a cocksure or overconfident manner. A man standing in the middle of a desert shouting, The world is my oyster, can shout all they like. As long as he is not bothering anyone else, balanced forces will leave him alone. However, when unfounded self-assuredness begins to compare itself with the abilities of others, dependent relationships are created. Confidence that is based on comparing oneself with others is pure excess potential, especially if one's confidence is based on a scornful or contemptuous attitude to other people. False confidence will sooner or later be punished with a clip around the ear or if you will excuse the expression, a kick up the arse. There is also a kind of ecstatic confidence that a shy person feels when they suddenly experience a whiff of self-confidence. This is also a false kind of confidence because it is based on a temporary emotional high that quickly passes. So, how can you acquire true self-confidence? Fighting feelings of insecurity is futile, and neither can insecurity be hidden behind a screen of false courage. You cannot hide the insecurity away, and the energy spent on trying to create it will turn against you. Trying to force confidence is also pointless. Any efforts made to artificially instigate courage and determination when they are not already present will also be wasted. Force yourself to keep it together when you are actually falling apart is totally impossible. As we said above, the energy of intention cannot be grasped or clenched. It just ends up being spent on maintaining the grip of control, leaving nothing behind to motivate action. It is ridiculous to try and develop confidence in any way at all. You may think that confidence grows by taking decisive action, but in reality, when a person stops fighting and starts taking action, the energy of intention releases its grip and switches from excess potentials to the implementation of action. In the end, the hands do what the eyes fear, and everything turns out well. Confidence is not developed through action. It is the energy of intention released. You cannot develop confidence. Confidence is like energy. It is either present or not present. Confidence, like self-belief, cannot be acquired by the means of auto-suggestion. 
You can repeat affirmations on how self-confident you are until you are blue in the face, but it will remain a naive and fruitless exercise. It is no different to fighting the symptoms of an illness without curing the cause. Whatever you try and do with your insecurity, it is not going anywhere. Wherever you look for confidence, you will not find it. Neither will you be able to maintain the corresponding thought transmission necessary to be on a constant wave of confidence. You might say to yourself in the morning, that's it, I am confident. Nothing can shake my self-confidence. I am solid as a rock. Try it, and you will see what happens afterwards. For a while, you really will feel more confident, which will make you feel extremely happy and even more confident. But, very soon, a pendulum will arrange some nasty provocation, and you will not even notice how you came crashing down on the wave of confidence. Once again, you will be irritated and depressed. Problem will come out of nowhere. Something will get you down, and you will have reason to fear and hate the world as before. You thought you glimpsed a light at the end of the tunnel, but you came to a dead end instead. So, how can you free yourself from the intricate labyrinth? You cannot actually, because there is no exit. The secret to the labyrinth is that its walls will crumble when you give up looking for the exit and abandon importance. The reasons for insecurity can be separated into two groups. The first group consists of internal causes, such as obsessive concern with one's personal qualities. This gives rise to feelings like dissatisfaction with self on account of one's shortcomings and lack of certain strengths, feelings of inferiority in comparison to others, bashfulness, fear of failure, looking stupid, etc. The second group consists of external factors linked with unrealistic overestimation of external factors. As a result, unfounded fears arise in relationship to the gap between one's meager inner qualities and the high demands of the external world, feeling very small in a big city, and finally, fear of reality. The paradox lies in the fact that to acquire self-confidence, you have to let go of wanting to acquire it. The labyrinth's walls are made out of importance. You are walking around the labyrinth, trying to get rid of your insecurity and acquire self-confidence. Confidence is a wild goose chase, another pendulum invention, a deceptive mirage, a trap for importance. Confidence is a pendulum game in which they always win. Where there is belief, there is always room for doubt. Likewise, where there is confidence, there is always room for hesitation and indecisiveness. Confidence is a kind of belief in success. A negative adjustment can be made to any scenario, and one small adjustment is more than enough to bring down the walls of confidence. The notion of confidence is constructed on excess potentials and dependent relationships. Any variation on the theme of confidence takes roughly the following format. I am determined. I am resolute and unshakable. I am better than everyone else. Nothing can stop me. I overcome all obstacles. I am stronger and braver than the rest. It goes on in the same vein. Confidence is nothing more than temporary excess potential. Whatever packaging you wrap it up in, it remains nothing more than excess potential. Even self-control is nothing more than a temporary concentration of tension. For confidence is just the opposite value of insecurity. Both potentials demand an output of energy, and the first will be inevitably destroyed by balanced forces. Therefore, the pursuit of confidence is as fruitless as chasing after an illusory happiness that hovers somewhere in the future. 
And so, we have just successfully broken through another false belief. But how are we to manage without confidence? Trend surfing offers an alternative. Coordination. What coordination represents, you will find out very shortly in the next section. Coordinating importance. Why do we need confidence to boldly and determinedly conquer our place in the sun? Pendulums have imposed one sacrosanct postulate which sounds, there is no such thing as a free lunch. If you want to achieve something, you have to fight for it, insist, demand, outstrip your rivals and elbow your way forwards. But in order to act boldly and decisively, you have to have confidence. As you know, the path of battle and rivalry is not the only way. If you reject the pendulum scenario, you can calmly take what is yours without having to put pressure on, without having to fight, but simply by finding the will to have. Freedom of choice represents a pernicious threat to pendulums. If everyone were to claim what was rightfully theirs without fighting for it, without spending energy creating obstacles and then overcoming them, the pendulums would be left with nothing. Despite the fact that it is extremely difficult to imagine the world without pendulums, the false stereotypes and beliefs they create are not as hard and fast as the laws of motion, for example. Awareness and intention enable you to ignore the pendulum's game and claim what is yours without having to fight for it. When there is freedom without struggle, there is no need for confidence. Confidence has only one origin, importance. Confidence represents the same potential as insecurity. It is just the opposite polarity of the same quality and both polarities are rooted in dependency on external factors and circumstances. The following metaphor describes the nature of this dependency. The pendulum leads a person along a path like a puppet on a string. The person does not believe that they can choose their own path or even walk independently. If the strings are kept even, the person walks with confidence like a child holding on to its mother's hand. But as soon as the strings relax and give some slack or start to jerk about, the person feels insecure and tries to tighten the strings. It is not that the pendulum is holding on to the person tightly. It is the person who will not let go of the strings of importance. They are afraid to let go because they are under the power of dependency which creates the illusion of support and confidence. In the end, the child will let go of its mother's hand and walk on its own, and the mother will encourage the child to do so. Pendulums, on the other hand, will try to convince the person that they will not be able to choose their own path by themselves or walk without the support of the strings. If the person were to shake off the delusion and let go of the strings of importance, they would find that they were able to walk freely wherever they wished and simply choose their goal without having to fight for it. Once a person has their freedom, they no longer need confidence and the illusion of support that it creates. All they really need is coordination to stop them from falling. Of course, they have become used to the stability and support they received when they were under the pendulum's power and holding on to the strings of importance. However, when they were giving their energy away to the pendulums, they would constantly disturb the balance and end up dangling helplessly at the end of their pseudo safety ropes. If a person could let go of the strings, all they would have to do to maintain their balance would be to avoid creating importance and excess potential. Confidence as a support would no longer be necessary because where there is no importance, there is nothing to guard or conquer. There is nothing to fear or be anxious about. 
As long as I do not attribute excessive meaning to anything, the layer of my world will not be distorted by excess potentials. Instead, I abandon the struggle and go with the flow. I am empty, and so there is nothing that can be hooked into, although this does not mean that I am hanging suspended in a vacuum. Finally, if I want it, the freedom of choice is mine. There is no need to struggle anymore. I just calmly walk my path and take what is mine. Unlike shaky confidence, this is a new state of conscious, composed coordination. Where does this feeling of peace come from? The feeling of inner calm comes from not creating inner importance and so having nothing to prove. When you carry the belief that you are an important person, the desire arises to prove it to others and excess potential is created. Then, balanced forces will do all they can to demystify the myth of your importance, repeatedly creating conditions designed to test your confidence to the limit. The slightest pang of inferiority prompts a person into struggling to raise and assert their sense of worth. Let go of the need to prove anything to yourself or others, and just accept whatever you needed to prove as a fundamental truth. You can spend your whole life battling to prove your worth, and yet, the moment you let go of the battle, you acquire it. A feeling of insecurity is intrinsically the same as low self-esteem. So, how can you improve your self-esteem? You probably think that I am now going to try and make you believe that you are much better than you give yourself credit for. This is what many psychologists do without a second thought. It is true that the opinion of others have of us is directly proportional to our own opinion of ourselves, as long as it does not border on arrogance. The moment you acknowledge your true value, free of any self-deception, others will agree with you. The only problem is that it is not that easy to convince yourself of your own true worth. Try it. If you suffer from low self-esteem, you will not succeed in persuading yourself of the opposite. However much you try and convince yourself of your own true worth, you will never quite be able to believe that you are special. Thoughts will creep in along the lines of, so where are they then, these special qualities of mine? I can see the shortcomings. They are obvious. So, I am not going to urge you to believe in your special qualities and raise your self-esteem, because I know that it would either make you smug and overconfident, or shove you deeper into despair. My advice would be to abandon the struggle for worth altogether. Do not try to believe or convince yourself of your own value. Simply let go of the battle and observe what happens. The people around you will start treating you with more respect as if they valued you more highly. As soon as you appreciate the fact of their attitude, the need to convince yourself or try to believe in something will fall away and you will simply know. It is a paradox, but it works every time. The battle for self-worth drains your free energy and channels it into the battle with the alternatives flow and the creation of excess potentials that drums up the winds of balanced forces. Together, all these circumstances create a tangled ball of problems fraught with all sorts of negative consequences. You cannot untangle the ball. Just abandon the struggle for self-worth and you will be surprised and delighted with the result. Your sense of self-worth will grow before your very eyes and your self-esteem will be enhanced and, in turn, the people around you will affirm your new sense of self. It is as pointless to try and deny or stamp out feelings of guilt as it is to artificially raise your self-esteem. If you have a disposition to feel guilt, 
you will never be able to stifle or banish the feelings of guilt you experience. So, what can you do? The same thing as with low self-esteem. Stop justifying yourself to others. Only ever justify yourself when it is absolutely necessary to explain your actions. Remember, no one has the right to judge you, whatever you have done, as long as you have not harmed anyone else. Do not take the blame publicly, and do not justify your actions. Let the manipulators fall through the emptiness, resisting the temptation to slam the door behind you silently leave the courtroom where people gather to profit from the guilt feelings of others. Give them nothing. If you have quite a deep guilt complex, then initially it will not hurt to put the lid on your conscience for a while. Do not invite others to judge your self-worth. Only by taking this attitude and not by means of inner battle will you rid your conscience of feelings of guilt. You will see how guilt just disappears into thin air. Having abandoned the battle for self-worth and given up justifying yourself, you will have settled the score with a significant portion of inner importance, as feelings of guilt and low self-worth are the predominant manifestations of inner importance. All other types of excess potential are derivatives of these two. You will no longer feel the need for protection as there is no longer anything to protect. Neither will you feel the need to pounce on others to preempt their attack. There is a saying that goes, do not frighten anyone and you will have nothing to fear. By the same token, if you reduce the importance of external factors, they will cease to reign over you with their preeminence. The two most oppressive kinds of outer importance are fear of the unknown and feeling overwhelmed by challenges. Both generate the dismal potential of panic and stress. Everyone is always concerned about something. People who are insecure prefer to bow under the weight of their problems, somehow dragging their burden along with them. Strong personalities strive to overcome their difficulties with force and decisiveness. They take the fortress by storm, penetrating its walls with the excess potential of overt confidence. Insecurity, like confidence, requires energy. In the case of insecurity, the energy mainly goes into panic and anxiety. And, in the case of confidence, the energy goes into overcoming obstacles. These are fairly elaborate methods of interacting with the outside world. In reality, everything is much simpler than it seems. As soon as you consciously reduce outer importance and abandon fighting against the alternative's flow, the obstacles you perceive will be cleared from your path. Do you really think you would need confidence? No. All you need now is good coordination to move with the flow and consciously control, not the script, but your importance levels. Energy that was previously channeled into maintaining all sorts of excess potential now goes on supporting the balance and just slightly helping the flow along with the ore of purified intention. Of course, you cannot ever totally stop attributing meaning to things in life however hard you might try. So do not fight to negate importance. Just release the grip and transform the energy of anxiety into the energy of action. Begin the process of doing in any way you can without insistence or pressure. The energy of excess potential will disperse through action, releasing the energy of intention and, with that, complex problems will be transformed into minor ones. As far as fear of the unknown is concerned, neither blind faith, nor auto-suggestion, nor false confidence will help you deal with it effectively. You may remember that I advised not thinking about the means to achieving your goal. 
you will never force yourself to believe in the possibility of a distant goal or total 100% success. So, abandon futile attempts to do so, as your faith will come to nothing, and temporary bursts of confidence quickly fade. You do not need confidence or faith. You need coordination. Coordination means taking pleasure in thinking about the goal as if it had already been reached, letting go of the grip of control over the script, and going with the alternative's flow, helping it along with the ore of pure intention. This is totally different to blind faith in success. Where there is faith, particularly blind faith, there is always room for doubt. It is the forced potential of importance that blinds. When you go with the flow in conscious awareness, everything falls into place without excessive effort. When you act in accordance with coordination, what you previously wanted to believe in but could not because it frightened you with the unknown, will soon appear from around a bend in the current. Doubts disappear when the mind is confronted with fact. Then, faith is transformed into knowledge, and fear of the unknown becomes satisfaction at the feeling of your own strength. The most important thing is to reduce importance and let go of controlling the script. It is also important to remember that you decide the level of complexity a challenge represents, and that adjustments to the script will play in your favor if you let them. Finally, absolute coordination is achieved as a result of harmony between heart and mind. If, on a conscious level, you are certain of what you want, but a worm of doubt or glimpse of depression sits in your subconscious, coordination remains an elusive quality. Harmony of heart and mind is achieved by listening to the whisperings of the heart and living true to your own credo. A lot has already been said about how and why to listen to the voice of the heart. All I will add here is that living according to your own credo means loving yourself, accepting yourself the way you are, not suffering from the pangs of conscience or guilt, and firmly acting according to the dictates of the heart and mind. Efforts to live true to your personal credo fall apart when self-esteem suffers and conflict arises between the heart and mind. It is, as you know, a wonderful thing to be able to live according to your true values and beliefs. It is even more wonderful to know that you do not have to create your credo, change it, or battle with it, although many people do, chipping away at their own credo as if it were literally a statue in marble. Titivating your credo will not bring you anything but fruitless soul-searching, spiritual torment, and self-doubt. Your personal credo cannot be shaped or drummed up as a result of struggle or other willful effort. You already have a credo. It is just that, like the heart, it gets sealed up in the box of importance. As soon as you let go of inner and outer importance, you will immediately sense that your credo has been freed. When importance is at zero, you have nothing to protect or conquer. You simply live in accordance with it and calmly take what is yours. By abandoning the battle for self-worth, not inviting others to judge your worth, and reducing outer importance, you finally acquire what is normally considered to be true confidence. This type of confidence is not the frail confidence built on excess potential, but a calm inner strength coordination. True, calm coordination does not relate to anything external, and so it requires neither confirmation nor proof. No doubt you have seen characters in films whose confidence is beyond question. True, Calm self-confidence can only come from inner self-sufficiency and the integrity of wholeness. 
You do not compare yourself to anyone. You are simply in a state of total balance. This kind of balance is achieved when there is a unity of heart and mind, when there is no feeling of guilt, dependency, superiority, obligation, fear, or stress. In other words, when you do not disturb the balance inside yourself or in the world around you. Live in harmony with the outside world, yourself, and your credo. This is the ideal we should strive towards in order to have complete confidence, that is, coordination. Achieved by any other means, confidence can only be artificial. Coordination grants you freedom from pendulums, allowing you to move independently in whatever direction you wish, to claim whatever you desire. If, at the present time, you have to fulfill tiresome obligations, detach yourself and imagine that you are being filmed for a movie. Hang on, for you will have to play your role to the end, at least until the end of the current series, until you walk through the right door. Practice visualizing your target slide without thinking about the means and wait for outer intention to open the door to you. The Battle with the Clay Golem At last, I am free of the unnecessary burden of excess potential. Inner and outer importance no longer exist. I have no need to assert my superiority or hide my inferiority. I fear neither the past nor the future. I have nothing to protect and nothing to conquer. I am finally free of the influence of pendulums and can take care of myself. If only this were true. Pendulums have great power, and part of the reason for their power is that people do not suspect they exist. It would not be right to talk about pendulums as if they were a secret group of aliens hatching a plot against the human race, because pendulums are an integral part of our world. They have a genuine impact on people, exerting their control via informational energy. Their influence takes effect on three levels, mental, emotional, and energetic. Pendulums pump free energy from people via the strings of importance. It has always been this way, except that recently, the purely informational impact has been greatly accelerated. Human civilization has evolved over many thousands of years, but it is only over the last decade that the picture has radically changed due to developments in the field of information technology. Volume of accumulated data stored on all kinds of servers is growing exponentially. The threat lies not so much in the volume of data being stored, but the methods and means of its distribution. We are ensnared in a web of telecommunications that become more dangerous with each passing day. We do not sense the danger, however, because the growth of the information industry takes place under the jovial anesthesia of new forms of entertainment and convenient tools that are fun to use. It is quite evident that the pendulum's goal is not to entertain its adherents, but to subject them to its power. The expansion and intricate elaboration of the information network has enabled the pendulum to attract a phenomenal number of adherents simultaneously. The greater the percentage of the population that watches the same program, the more energy the pendulum can harvest. The stronger the pendulum becomes, the greater its influence, and the more easily adherents are persuaded to follow the rule, do as I do. The pendulum's rule works well and succeeds in drawing people away from their innermost goals. The process is now approaching its final stage in which man is ultimately deprived of the freedom of choice. One day, people will find themselves in a situation in which they represent nothing more than an element of a monstrous informational energy matrix. The individual will be shut in a box of conditioning 
and transformed into a detail of the greater machine. The matrix grid will determine how each element should function and what they should wish for. As you know, science fiction has a tendency to become reality in its time. This process is already taking place steadily and unnoticeably. There is nothing that can be done about it. Subordination does not necessarily have to be brought about by force. It is sufficient to shape the individual's worldview in such a way that they have no notion of their freedom. This is what is happening now. It is relatively difficult to preserve a sense of freedom under these conditions. And so, we will take a closer look at specific aspects of pendulum protection methods. As you know, importance is the only thing a pendulum can use to hook into. A pendulum can even hook into your attributing great importance to keeping importance at zero. Everything that has been said in relation to pendulums is quite serious. But here lies the paradox. If you now declare war on pendulums in earnest, you will be destined to fail. The most important principle in the battle with the pendulum is to refuse to fight them. You have to understand that this is not a fight with a tangible object, but a battle with a clay golem, a game, and so it is up to you what kind of fight you want it to be. If you perceive the process as a fight, you will lose whatever happens because you cannot beat a pendulum in battle. If you challenge the golem even along the lines of, now, I know it is just a clay golem, I will show it, you can consider yourself defeated. If you perceive it as a game, you will, at worst, lose the round, but not the fight. Pendulum is just a golem, whilst you are conscious of the essence of the game and refuse to observe its rules. Pendulums will lie in wait for their victim every time they feel confident. Be prepared for the fact that they will try to throw you off balance in any way they can. This is the nature of the game. You take the bait, lose your sense of balance, get very upset, and feed your energy to the pendulum. You start off calm, happy, and balanced, but it does not last long before the pendulum provokes you get involved in a dodgy situation or receive bad news. In accordance with the script, you should get stressed, become afraid, despair, feel dejected, and express your irritation or dissatisfaction. All you have to do when this happens is wake up and remember what the game is, and then instantly reduce importance. If you do this with conscious awareness, pendulum will fall through into emptiness. You can break the game rules as long as you are not daydreaming. In non-lucid dreaming, the dreamer is always a victim of circumstance. The dream just happens, and you cannot do anything about it. In waking life, people have long been accustomed to reacting just as automatically to any negative influence, and I do not have to explain what follows. However, you are not an oyster and are more than capable of responding in an inadequate manner. If you deliberately act strangely, the pendulum's plans will be ruined. You just have to come to your senses in time and break the rules of the game. You will see for yourself just how pleasant it is when you realize that you are aware the pendulum is desperately trying to provoke you and you do not take the bait. The pleasant feeling does not only come from being proud of yourself for being strong. There is another reason, too. When you give your energy to a pendulum, you become weaker. But when the pendulum tries to provoke you and you resist, you become the receiver of the energy the pendulum channeled into the provocation, making you stronger. This additional strength is experienced as a pleasant feeling. Now, you can imagine how great the pendulum feels when it feeds on your energy. Do not 
give the pendulum the opportunity. It will pursue you time and again, but do not weaken. Let it spend its energy on you. During the game where you are breaking the rules, do not be tempted to get angry or frustrated with the game. All the time that you are playing with conscious awareness, you are having fun, fighting a golem with sugar savers, and it will not be able to touch you. If you break the rules and manage to retain a condition of inner balance, the golem will shatter into pieces. However, as soon as you begin to lose your temper, the pendulum's sugar saber will be transformed into a dangerous blade. Then, the game could turn into a battle and end in an induced transition. Do not fight your reaction to being provoked. Look at it from a different perspective. The emotions you experience are the effect, the cause of which is your relationship to what is happening. You have to consciously change your response to the negative factor. It is not difficult to display an inadequate attitude because you are aware that it is just a game. Let the jester jump. It is if you are fighting an invisible opponent in a room of mirrors. It seems as if the pendulum is right next to you, but in reality, what you are seeing is not the pendulum or even the pendulum's reflection. The reflection in the mirror is your importance. All the time that something has exaggeratedly important meaning, you will have an opponent that constantly looms at you in the mirrors. Whilst importance is kept at zero, there is nothing to fear, nothing to protect, and no one to attack. Then, the mirrors of importance will splinter into tiny pieces, and you will see that the golem has crumbled. You do not need toughness in the battle with the pendulum. Emptiness is considerably more effective. The expressions impenetrable, nerves of steel, iron will, steadfast, endurance, and self-control, among others, imply protection, tension, and readiness to fight back. Maintaining this type of protective field requires a huge amount of energy. As you know, all this energy is feed for the pendulum. Yet, if I am empty, I have no need to maintain the protective field. Energy is not wasted, and the golem falls into emptiness and crumbles. All you have to do is consistently remind yourself of the rules of the game and be conscious to keep importance at zero. The need to keep importance at zero should not escalate into a permanent state of readiness for defense combat. You should not attach excessive meaning to the game itself. Relax and allow yourself to lose from time to time. There is no need to strive for victory at all cost. Whilst you maintain your grip of control, the pendulum can twist you about. It will drag you about like a dog grips onto a stick it does not want to let go of. If the game is not any fun, display the maximum level of indifference possible by losing and not caring at all. If the pendulum wins a round, do not be stubborn. Accept that you lost the game. There is nothing wrong with losing your inner balance and getting upset. Do not give yourself a hard time over it the next game will be yours. And do not promise yourself that this time will be the last, or set an ultimatum or trap to fall into. You think you are setting an ultimatum for yourself, but actually you are setting it for the pendulum, which is exactly what it is waiting for. Ultimatums are nothing but a powerful wall of protection. By putting up a protective wall, you turn the game into a battle in which you will inevitably suffer defeat. Be prepared for pendulums to provoke you gently and softly. Many people look for a prop in cigarettes, alcohol, and drugs when they are flagging under the weight of their problems. The next time you give up a harmful habit and tell yourself, that is it, 
this is the last one. This is not you talking. Pendulum can so capture your thought wave that it can literally impose thoughts on you. Every time you swear to yourself, just one last time, and then that is it. Wake up and shake off the delusion. This is the pendulum speaking. Being consciously aware of this fact will help you to indifferently split with a bad habit, not decisively, but indifferently. There is nothing that pendulums will not do to attract adherence. They have completely whittled away everything sacred, from ethical principles to religion. The world is a manifestation of the One Spirit, an affirmation of multiplicity in oneness. The divine essence penetrates all living and non-living beings. God lives in each and every one of us. We touched on this previously when we compared the human soul to a drop in the ocean. As soon as God informed human beings of his existence via his manifestation on earth, the pendulums instantly took religion under their control. You can see this for yourself if you look at the original Ten Commandments. The first commandment, despite its various interpretations, is in essence the following. Thou shall have no other gods before me. This statement demands that man believe in the existence of the one God who rules over all creation. But people broke the commandment straight away and created numerous other religions, i.e. pendulums. Rather, they allowed themselves to become subordinated to the pendulums of religion. The pendulums of religion hide behind the name of the Lord. Spiritual ministers genuinely try to preach the word and work of the Lord, but, being adherents themselves, they are held under the power of pendulums and so very little actually depends on their actions. Can religious war and conflict really please God? The second commandment, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water underneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. This also refers to pendulums. The pendulum subjects adherence to its will and forces them to act in its interests, whatever the circumstances, and no matter what the good intentions are that conceal its true purpose. All the commandments can basically be reduced to two. In the words of Jesus responding to the question, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is similar to the first. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The whole of the law and the prophets depends upon these two commandments. Love God in yourself and others without worshipping pendulums. This is all that the commandments urge you to do. The negative impact of the mass media on the human psyche requires the individual to be very consciously aware. Do not let negative information affect you. Everywhere you look, someone is trying to seduce you, capture your attention, or force something on you. Any group of people has its pendulum. When adherents carry out the pendulum's will, they are often unaware of its true goals. So, you should always ask yourself the question, Who needs this and why? Do I need it? At the same time, actively search for any information that relates to your goal. Yes, yes, your mind impatiently replies, I know that already. And what of it that your mind already knows? Despite all that the mind already knows, it still 
carelessly nods off every time the pendulum starts a game. Do not let the pendulum come and lead you away by the hand. Generally speaking, your task comes down to consciously breaking the rules. This can be done in two ways. Either drop importance and scupper the pendulum in the emptiness of your indifference, or still its sway by reacting in an inadequate manner. If you struggle with reducing importance, you can always stick with the second method. Any inadequate reaction to provocation is a gross violation of the rules of the game. Ending the battle. The freedom of choice lies in one incredibly simple fact. There is no need to fight to achieve your goal. All you need is the will to have. As soon as you allow yourself to have, you can begin the process of calmly placing one foot in front of the other in the direction of your goal. Pendulums will impose a different scenario, forcing you to fight for your goal, declaring war on the world and yourself. Pendulums recommend starting with yourself. They make you believe that you are not perfect, and so will not achieve your goal until you change. Once you have changed, then you must join the battle for a place in the sun. There is only one motivation behind this scenario, which is to drain the victim's energy. By battling with yourself, you give your energy to the pendulum, and you do just the same when you join the battle against the outside world. The word battle in this context presupposes constant tension, struggle, and discipline. You have to be ever ready for battle, as warriors are who vaguely understand that somewhere in the world there is freedom. The mistake of the warrior is that they think they have to fight for their freedom. They spend their lives at war, always putting off their main fight until later. Warriors do not believe that you can just walk up and take your freedom. They tell themselves and others that it is an extremely challenging task requiring years of hard work and sweat. The transurfing pilgrim does not get involved in the fight for freedom because they know that freedom is already theirs. No one can force you to fight, and yet, if you are not filled with inner and outer importance, you really do not have any other choice. The closest thing to battle in transurfing is the intention to act impeccably but rather than requiring tactical efficiency and discipline, it requires conscious awareness. If you find it difficult to just claim and allow yourself the idea of having, you may put it off to return to later. But for how long? The yarn of postponement can go on all your life. Putting it off until the next time makes life in the present moment a mere dress rehearsal for some better future. People are always unsatisfied by the present moment and console themselves with the hope that things will soon improve. With this attitude, the better future will never come. It will always hover just in front of you for you to chase after, and it will be just the same as trying to catch up with the setting sun. The idea that you still have plenty of time is an illusion. You can spend your entire life in expectation of a better future. There is the saying, there is nothing more permanent than the temporary. In reality, there is no time to wait. Do not wait for the future, but insert it into the current moment. Allow yourself to have here and now. That does not mean that your goal will be realized instantly. We are talking about will, i.e. the intention to have, in contradistinction to the ongoing battle with the self. The will to have is infinitely more powerful than the will to act. If you have spent your whole life taking part in the battle for a place in the sun, 
How far has it got you? Did you have to drag yourself to your boring job or to college, as if to forced labor, whilst someone else was relaxing at a ski resort or warming themselves in the sunshine by the ocean? Perhaps they won their battle and are now able to enjoy life? The majority of people who participate in the battle would not be able to afford to go to a ski resort. Even if they saved up for it their whole life, and if you can afford to give yourself a few days pleasure once a year, then that is always an achievement. But what often happens is you arrive and the weather is bad, or the ski lift is broken, or you have to deal with other problems you could not have foreseen. Even if everything goes well, the thought will still be in your mind that you should be economical and you will remember how hard you worked to earn the money to pay for these few days of holiday, which is so quickly coming to an end. You will have had a nice time in principle, but then you will have to return to the grey days of working life and slave away again. You won the battle and earned a holiday, and yet, from time to time, a dark shadow creeps into your thoughts. You are convinced that you have to work long and hard to earn just a short time of pleasure. You are not ready to totally give yourself permission to have. Those who give themselves permission to have do not take part in the battle. They are too busy. For example, a lucky couple were taking a break at a ski resort in Switzerland last week. They had a ball. All balls eventually come to an end, but in different ways for different people. Now, the couple is arguing about where to go next. He wants to go to the Australian Alps, but she would rather go to the French Alps. The whole scene may remind you of some superficial soap opera, but for the couple, it is more than a serious matter. The difference in perception is caused by different levels of willingness to have. You will trudge away for another year until you have a holiday, whereas the couple expect to have their next holiday in a week's time. The rational mind may be upset, protesting, but how can that be? After all, they were born with their millions, whereas I have to earn my money. Where would I get the money? How many times have we already said that you do not have to think about the money? When you end the battle and give yourself permission to have, outer intention will a way of giving you what you need. I cannot prove this to you right here and now, but you can test the principle for yourself and do not try it, just do it, and not tomorrow, but today. Allow yourself to have from this moment onwards, unconditionally and unreservedly, and not occasionally, but all the time. If you do not expect instant results, and continue to allow yourself to have, one fine day something will happen that others will want to call a miracle. Those who are born with millions are already imbued with the will to have. They do not have to think about it, whereas you will have to work with slides. The mind will worry about how realistic the goal is and the means to achieve it, but this is the path of battle that leads nowhere. If you take this path, you will never earn enough money. Earn the will to have not the money. If you concentrate on the goal as if you had already achieved it, your doors will open and the means will take care of themselves. The freedom of it all is enough to make your head spin. You may choose not to accept this freedom. It is your choice. Nothing would be easier than to say that this is all rubbish and continue toiling away the rest of your life. Everyone makes their choices and receives what they are willing to have. Your choice is immutable law, and with it, you shape your own reality. 
choice in the alternative space takes place roughly in the following way. People wander into a supermarket where they are asked, what would you like? One customer replies, I would like to become a star in show business. The shop assistant replies, no problem. Here is a great version, especially for you. World fame, wealth, shine. Will you take it? Surprised, the customer says, well, how can I put this? It is not that easy. Only a handful ever really make it, and the chosen few have unique talents, whereas I am just your average Joe Bloggs. The shop assistant shrugs their shoulders. What has talent got to do with it? Here's your item. Take it. The customer then says, it is really hard to get into show business. It is a bit of a jungle, a world full of sharks. The shop assistant comes back with, Okay, so here's a massive shark to help you make it. Take it, you will not regret it. The customer replies, The stars of show business have such luxurious homes, fancy cars, top society. Could all that really be mine? I can hardly believe it. At which point the shop assistant says, Oh well, it is a shame of course. I do not think we can help you. And puts the item back on the shelf. In the same way a person might cautiously ask another, Do you know how to fly on a commercial airliner? Of course, the other replies. I simply sit in the seat, fasten my seatbelt, and the aeroplane lifts up into the air. As soon as you allow for the idea that achieving the goal is simply a matter of choice, you will begin to feel just how absurd the customer's concerns are in the alternatives space shop. It is just a matter of being willing to have. That is all. You might fall into the trap of battling with yourself for the will to have. Whatever you do, do not force yourself to allow yourself to have. Do not force yourself to picture the target slide. You should not need to push yourself. Do not pressure yourself or tense up over it, for that again makes it a battle. Simply take pleasure in having exciting thoughts. Abandon importance and end the battle. Nothing is achieved by battling. The reason you continue battling is because everything around you has been elevated in importance. You cannot allow yourself to have at the same time as fighting ardently for your place in the sun. You may be resolute and full of confidence that you will have what is yours and are enthusiastically convincing yourself that it is all down to your personal choice. Yet, to act forcefully entails creating excess potential. What is required is more like a carefree light-hearted resolve. Relax. Let go your grip of control and just be aware of the fact that you are taking what is yours. You do not need to drum up momentum and enthusiasm to go to buy a paper. If they do not have the paper you want, you just walk to the other newsagents. Release your deadly grip. By trying to release your grip, it becomes even tighter. Any kind of diligence or effort only aggravates excess potential. Importance is the underlying cause of effort and compulsive grip. You cannot relax the grip if you are battling with it. Abandon importance and the grip will relax of its own accord. Reducing importance shifts the arrow that indicates the direction of intention from the inner intention zone to the outer intention zone. Any pressure that is applied is the result of importance. When you try to put pressure on a situation, your actions are directed by inner intention. Willpower is essential in overcoming obstacles, but as we now know, obstacles are born of importance. Obstacles disintegrate the moment you reduce importance 
and willpower is no longer required. When importance disappears, the need to push for your goals transforms into the will to have, and then outer intention sets in. You do not have to win the right to choose. You already have it. If you feel filled with decisiveness to win your right to choose, prepare to be disappointed. If you are filled with decisiveness and vigor, you again hold the deadly grip. Balanced forces will quickly cool your smoldering coals, and pendulums, having sensed your importance, will immediately try to provoke you. You will see for yourself that this is how it works. Do not let unsuccessful attempts to acquire dispassionate will worry or upset you. People are very used to channeling their energy not so much towards their goals as towards the feed for pendulums. Eventually, you will learn to differentiate between decisiveness and will. The will to have is the dispassionate, unemotional intention to take what is unquestionably yours. Does not it sound weird to say, I am absolutely full of decisiveness to get the post from the letterbox? You must exercise your right to choose just as calmly and uninsistently as you would retrieve your post from the letterbox. In life, people are always having to take tests, exams, take part in contests, and all sorts of personal assessments but the will to have depends only on yourself. You are your own examiner. Any mark you give yourself is usually a reflection either of the belief that you are incapable and unworthy or that the goal is unrealistic. People do this automatically, out of habit. All you have to do is allow yourself to have whatever else is happening. It is unfamiliar, of course, but why not dare to try it and allow yourself to have? Newton's and anyone else's apples may fall to the ground, but let yours fall to the sky. You might desperately wish to acquire the will to have, but nonetheless, abandon desire. Enough of desiring. You are going to get what you need anyway. Just think about taking what already belongs to you. Take it calmly, without demanding or insisting, with the thought of, if I want it, what is the problem? I will have it. Release. The will to have is created by the free energy of intention. Two things get in the way of allowing yourself to have. The first is conflict between the heart and mind. The second is the excess potential of inner and outer importance, which use up free energy. One would be mistaken to think that the will to have is equal to banal thinking that sounds, I want and I will. In reality, such thoughts must be filled with the energy of intention. Otherwise, they will just be the mumbling of the mind and nothing more. Thoughts must flow from the unity of heart and mind. Otherwise, the programming of the energy of intention will not be pure. If a large portion of free energy is consumed by excess potential, intention will have no power to it. The difficulties we experience in acquiring will are similar to the reservations a person feels when they sit at the handlebars of a bicycle without stabilizers for the very first time. The person knows that it is possible in principle, but they also know that they will not manage it on their first attempt. They doubt their abilities and yet are filled with the desire to learn. A person tries to control the learning process, but does not understand what to do. Three types of excess potential are immediately created. Doubt, desire, and control, and all three drain the energy of intention. 
The mind tries to keep balance this way and that, but the bicycle keeps falling over because there is not enough unity of heart and mind or free energy. Then there comes a point at which the mind gives some slack on control and the unity of heart and mind appears that is so essential to maintaining balance. As a result, you can suddenly do it, although the mind has no idea how. But that is the whole point. The mind always thinks about the means and how one should act. It takes control and tries various options. The heart, in contrast, does not think. It is simply unreservedly willing to have. The mind is also willing to have but only on the condition that things are clear and rational. The conflict between heart and mind arises because the mind doubts the goal can be realistically achieved. As soon as the grip of control weakens, the limiting conditions of the mind fall away to reveal unity between heart and mind. The mind is surprised by the fact that its control is not necessary and that everything works of its own accord. However, this fact is enough for the mind to accept, even if it does not totally understand what happened. The rider can balance, and so the mind accepts it. The mind gives up enforcing its control because it is now convinced that it is not necessary. After a little practice, the other excess potentials disappear as well, and the energy of intention is released, at which point riding the bicycle goes from being a challenge to a pleasure. In order to acquire the will to have, you have to achieve unity of heart and mind and release the energy of intention. Unity of heart and mind is achieved when you are on the path to your goal through the right door. It remains only to determine your innermost aspirations and set out on the path. By laying down the useless burden of inner and outer intention, you release the energy of intention, the moving force for transition in the alternative space. When you are dragging inner and outer importance around with you, you waste 99% of your energy on supporting excess potential. How can you source free energy if it is all tied up in potential? In order to drop importance, you need to take action consciously. You need to be aware of what you are attributing excess meaning to and the consequences of doing so. Unfortunately, our attempts to consciously abandon importance on an intellectual level are not always successful. The answer then is to take action because the power behind excess potential dissipates in the process of doing. The action you take can be turning the target slide round in your mind, visualizing the process, and calmly placing one foot in front of the other in the direction of your goal. How not to be afraid? Get a safety net. The hardest excess potential to overcome is fear. You cannot force yourself to be unafraid. If something that has excessively important meaning in your life is threatened, something that you cannot let go of, such as your life, career, or home, the only way to stop fueling the potential is to find cover, a plan B, or alternative route. How not to worry or get anxious? Act. The potential of anxiety and panic is dispersed through action. Idle worrying will continue to plague you until you take proactive action. The type of activity you turn to does not necessarily have to be related to the cause of your stress. As long as you do something, your anxiety will be reduced. How not to desire? Accept the possibility of defeat and act. It is just as difficult to eradicate the potential of desire as the potential of fear, because letting go totally of your desire to reach your goal is almost impossible. 
However, if you accept the possibility of defeat beforehand and find alternatives rue, the potential of desire will, at least, become more balanced. Desire can always be transformed into action. Desire is what becomes before intention. When desire is translated into the determination to act, the energy channeled into the potential disperses. The energy of desire then goes towards shaping your intention. How not to wait. Act. The potential of waiting is dispersed through action by definition. Dissolve desire and expectation in action. How to let go of self-worth. If you have understood this book thus far, this question ought to sound a little out of keeping with what has been said before. Of course, Transurfing encourages you to stand up and accept your worth as an axiom rather than resigning yourself to feelings of personal worthlessness. The difficulty with this is that the mind only senses its worth when other people treat you accordingly. Taking this into consideration, the secret to increasing your standing is as simple as it is effectual. All it requires is for you to abandon the tendency to take action aimed at increasing your sense of self-worth. Examine your behavior. How do you respond when you feel the need to protect your sense of self-worth? Whatever your knee-jerk reaction is, be it demanding attention and respect, feeling you have to prove that you are right, taking offense, being defensive, and justifying your actions, getting drawn into conflict, acting superior and arrogant, insisting on being the leader, belittling someone else and pointing out their shortcomings or showing off your strengths. Whatever it is, other people will subconsciously pick up on it. If you do not automatically rush to protect your sense of self-esteem, it suggests that you have a healthy sense of your own worth people will start to treat you differently. When the mind sees that it is being treated with more respect, it starts to acknowledge its own worth. When you start to realize your own value, other people around you will see it too, without exception. By letting go, you receive the very thing you gave up. How to not get irritated so easily? Play the pendulum's game and break the rules. This is the only way to ditch the habit of reacting negatively to unpleasant information. You already know how this is done. You just have to remember quickly enough that it is just a game and then humorously break the rules by reacting inadequately. When you hear a piece of good news rather than reacting limply, Respond happily with overt enthusiasm so that you radiate the energy at the vibration of the wave of good fortune. Pendulums will cause you problems to make you lose your sense of inner balance and generate negative energy. By reacting in an inadequate manner, you disturb the pendulum's rhythm, leaving it with nothing. Have a go at playing the game in this way. It is quite entertaining. How to get over feeling guilty? Stop trying to justify yourself. As I have already said, only you keep yourself in the courtroom to be judged. You are the one playing all the roles of prosecutor, lawyer, and defendant, and the manipulators exploit that. Leave the courthouse. No one can detain you. Those who gather to listen will sit there for a while and then go on their own way once they realize there is no defendant. With time, your case will be closed. This is the only way you can get rid of your guilty feelings. How to deal with resentment and indignation. You will not experience these feelings of anger if you rid yourself of guilt and acknowledge your worth. End the battle and go with the flow. 
You might sometimes find that you are quietly going with the flow when someone grabs hold of you and starts to pull you against the current. What should you do? People who have a skill are generally capable of finding solutions to their problems. And then there are other people who only know how to find problems. They seek out problems and then triumphantly present them as if they were some huge achievement. They seem to genuinely believe that others are obliged to offer a solution in response. If you start trying to find the solution for them, you will soon be surrounded by an entire crowd of idle rags. Some will criticize, and the others will find new problems, give advice, or take charge and make demands. However hard you try to go with the flow, there will be others to make it more difficult. Naturally, this evokes resentment and indignation. What should you do if you are not able to deal with the resentment and indignation you feel? Simply allow yourself not to be able to deal with it. Giving excessive meaning to the need to keep importance to a minimum will only make things worse. And who do you work for? Or some boss man? If you do, you will inevitably regularly experience feelings of resentment and indignation. Move onto the path that leads towards your goal, and then, with time, when you do work, you will work only for yourself. Until that day comes, allow yourself occasionally to blow up and create excess potential. Do not pressure yourself to win all the time. Instead of fighting with the different kinds of excess potential you create, you should act with purified intention, and intention is purified in the process of doing through movement. As you can see, achieving the will to have takes more than just speculative exercises. It requires concrete action. Begin placing one foot in front of the other in the direction of your goal in whatever way you can. Your actions will become more effective in the process of doing. The will to have has three stages. The first stage is inhibition caused by an unfamiliar situation. Surely this cannot all be for me. When you run the target slide in your mind, you will not quite be able to take in the fact that it might all be possible. The second stage is delight a feeling close to weightlessness. There will come a point when you accept the goal into your comfort zone and feel the sense of restriction fall away. The realization that the goal is actually quite realistic evokes a feeling of elation. The feeling of weightlessness is also quite real, being caused by the release of the energy of intention from excess potential. This is what you will feel. With time, the will to have shifts into its third stage of ordinariness. Because you are constantly turning the target slide around in your mind, you think yourself into its content and, gradually, everything in the slide starts to become ordinary. The slide is based on the film rule of importance. All the time that you desire, doubt, and puzzle over the means the will to have is standing on a shaky foundation. As soon as importance dissolves, the will to have gains power. At the same time, it is important not to let go of the will to act, i.e. the intention to place one foot in front of the other in the direction of your goal. If you have moved through all three stages of the will to have, you are undoubtedly on the right road. And, finally, how not to give way under the weight of your problems. There is always something that will get us down to one degree or another. It is extremely difficult to just up and let go of all importance, but there is one very interesting and powerful method in transurfing that can help. Coordinating Intention 
people normally feel that they are subject to circumstances, powerless to change the way things are. Sometimes they are lucky and fly on the wave of fortune for a short time. Sometimes it even looks as if success is just within reach. All you have to do is act decisively and put up a good fight. And yet, despite all your efforts, defeat follows victory. It is as if people are walking along a road lined with high hills and deep pits. The ones who are confident and determined turn off the even road and, for some reason, start scrambling up the hillsides towards seductively shining prizes left there by the pendulums. Sometimes, a person makes an incredible effort and manages to take the prize, but, more often than not, the attempt is unsuccessful. Having found themselves at the top of the hill, the person is then pulled off their feet by the wind of balanced forces and sent tumbling, head over heels, to the bottom of the hill, once again feeling powerless to change anything. Then, there are the negativists who believe that they are totally powerless to change anything and therefore prefer to wallow feebly in the holes of their worst expectations. Naturally, their worst expectations are instantly realized. The negativists do not only suffer from their own impotence. In their infantilism, they also hand over their destiny to others in the matter of God's will be done. They do not move with the alternative's flow, neither do they go against it. They simply wallow in their own discontent, poisoning the atmosphere around them. The only thing they do well is realize their worst expectations, and they get a kick out of the fact that they are at least right about something. They have perfected the art of confirming their own negative attitude. People like this take a kind of sadomasochistic pleasure from negativity. They can make a mountain out of the tiniest molehill. Their motto is, life is loathsome and gets worse with every passing day. And, having made this choice, they find confirmation of it in everything. They are such natural sufferers that they are constantly being blamed and punished. Such is the bitter lot of the martyr. They are literally swimming in a sea of negativity. Why? Because negativity is the only thing they have that the world can agree with them on and meet them halfway. They find strength in the assurance that their worst expectations will be confirmed. Sometimes, a negativist will accidentally find themselves on a wave of fortune. For a while they might actually feel happy and content, but it does not last long because they cannot resist looking around about intently for the spell of bad luck they are so comfortable with. And why not? After all, anything good comes to an end and good luck, well, it just is not normal. It is not natural. The negativist sets out to catch hold of a tale of bad luck so that they can return to their familiar ditch where everything is terrible, but predictable. They search for something to which they can attach their discontent, listening to the disasters in the news, complaining, blaming, and generally making demands. If making demands does not work, they crawl into the role of victim who everyone must calm and soothe. It is extremely difficult to wean a negativist off the habit of finding comfort in self-torture. It is an extreme case. The tragedy is that the negativity does not only poison one life. By negatively transforming the layer of their own world, the negativist drags those they are closest to whose layers intersect into their own pitiful hell. Paradox lies in the fact that, although the negativist seems impotent, in reality they have a power that they exploit to its full force. The negativist's power lies in the firm conviction that life is terrible 
and gets worse with every passing day. The firm conviction is nothing other than the will to have, which is why the negativist's choices are successfully transformed into physical reality. The negativist makes the choice and the world meets them halfway. In reality, we are not impotent and we do have the power to make changes in our lives. The fact that the negativist's worst expectations are realized proves that everyone is capable of influencing the course of events, capable of determining the script, not only in dreaming, but in waking also. Perhaps it is just a matter of substituting the negative attitude with a positive one. Life is wonderful and gets better with every passing day. And yet, if you adopt this motto, you embark on a journey across the clouds. If you doubt for one moment or look down out of fear, you will instantly come to a halt and fall downwards from a great height. A negative outlook persists so firmly because from birth, a person is used to thinking that the world is out to get them. A huge wave of aggression sweeps over little people soon after they are born. There they were, lying in the womb, all cozy, warm, and peaceful, when, suddenly, the poor child is roughly squeezed out of their comfortable home, hearing the mother's screams and possibly aware of the fact that they are the cause of her suffering. With this, the foundation for a guilt complex is laid. Light glare in the child's face, making it crinkle up its face to protect its eyes. Moist warmth is replaced with harsh, dry cold. The child just wants to crawl up into a ball and hide from the horror of what is happening. But with that, they cut the umbilical cord, crudely severing the only connection with the source of life. The child is already experiencing a fatal shock. It is suffocating and does not know yet that it must breathe. It then suffers the trauma of being slapped on the back. It then cuts into the lungs with the sharpness of a razor. It is painful to breathe, but the child has no other choice. The conditions are harsh. Either fight for your life or die. The innocent, pure mind is forced to take in its first lesson. The battle for survival is an integral part of life. The child is afraid and in pain and, to top it all, is then taken away from its mother and shut up in a sterile box. Exhausted, the child attempts to hide from life in the safety of its dreams. Such is our first encounter with the outside world, filled with fear, loneliness, hopelessness, resentment, anger, and total impotence. These are the initial lessons that are harshly and indelibly printed, marked on the clean slate of the mind. The inroad, so essential to pendulums, has been successfully made. It is no coincidence that these shocking methods of childbirth are, to this day, widespread and considered civilized practice. Rarely does it occur to anyone that a birth of this nature is a terrible shock for the child that leaves a deep wound in the subconscious for life. No creature in the animal kingdom experiences anything even remotely similar at birth. Only in occasional and very expensive clinics can one be assured of a more personable birth. The first harsh lessons of the world of pendulums are well assimilated and consolidated even further over the course of one's life. There comes a time when the child lets go of its mother's hand and runs out with joyous, innocent courage to meet life. But the world of pendulums shows the child that life is not that safe after all. Suddenly, bang, the child falls over. The mother is worried that her child may have been hit by a car. I am saying this simply to convey how very deeply the predisposition to negativity 
is rooted in our consciousness, while the good intentions of positivism often end up carrying you into the clouds, building castles in the air, or drumming up all your strength to take by storm the fortresses on the ground. So, what do you have to do to make sure that you maintain coordination and walk upon even ground without plunging into holes in the ground or clambering over obstacles? Reduce importance and go with the flow? Exactly. It is not easy, however, because it is not possible to free yourself from importance completely and the anxious mind that daydreams and wants to control everything prevents you from going with the flow. Nonetheless, there is a solution, simple and yet ingenious. You can make use of the mind's inclination to control everything and offer it a new game. The idea of the game is, every time something bad happens, the mind has to wake up, consciously evaluate the level of importance being attributed, and then change its relationship to the problem. Your mind is sure to like it. We have already looked at the principles of the game. They are the same as the humorous battle with the golem. But that is not all. Here, we come to the main principle of coordination. If you allow yourself to be guided by this principle, you will achieve the same level of success in realizing the positive as negativists do in realizing their worst expectations. It goes like this. If you choose to perceive seemingly negative changes in the script as positive, that is what their outcome will be. If not absurd, it still sounds a little unconvincing, does it not? What could possibly be positive about an obvious setback and what good is there to be found in misfortune? And yet, however strange it might sound, the principle works every time. Once again, I assure you that I am not asking you to believe in the principle I describe. Simply experiment with it. Try it out in practice. There is also a logical explanation for the mind. As you know, the world is constructed on the principle of dualism. Everything has an opposite manifestation. Light and dark, black and white, positive and negative, full and empty, etc. When you walk across a log and fall to one side, you automatically lift your arm on the opposite side of your body to compensate for the movement. Likewise, every event on a lifeline has two branches of potential realization, one favorable and one unfavorable. Every time you come up against one event or another, you make a choice about what your relationship to that event will be. If you choose to perceive the event as something positive, you position yourself on a favorable branch of the lifeline. A predisposition for negativity, however, causes a person to express their discontent and choose an unfavorable branch on the lifeline. From first thing in the morning, people get irritated by the slightest little thing and then the next thing until their whole day has turned into a constant trail of trouble. Obviously, even with the small things, as soon as you lose your inner balance, the negative scenario evolves into a drama. As soon as the one thing brings you down, the next thing follows. This is why we say that things always happen in threes. The trail of trouble does not follow on from the initial irritation so much as from your attitude towards it. How the pattern is formed depends on the choice you make when you are standing at the fork in the road. It might only be a minor irritation that has shaken you out of sorts, but irrespective of the magnitude of the irritation, you are already radiating energy at the frequency of the unfavorable branch in your lifeline. 
Moreover, a negative attitude creates tension potential, which drains your intention energy. Your actions become ineffective and you stumble upon the next bigger irritation. You can imagine where you will end up in life if you keep following the map of negative branches. Essentially, this is what facilitates the generation shift. Now, imagine a different scenario. Something happens that irritates you. Take a moment before rushing in with a negative attitude and responding in the primitive manner of the oyster. Say to yourself, stop, it is just a game with a golem. Okay, golem, let's play. Whatever is happening, stay positive and pretend that you're pleased. There is a reason why we have the phrases, a blessing in disguise and every cloud has a silver lining. Try to look for the positive in any difficult or annoying situation. Be glad, even if you fail to find anything positive to hang on to. Adopt the foolish habit of rejoicing in setbacks. It is much more fun than getting irritated and whining at every little inconvenience. You will see that, in the majority of cases, your inconvenience will act in your favor. And, even if that is not the case, you can be certain that your positive attitude has shielded you from other misfortune and carried you onto a favorable branch in your lifeline. As a rule, annoyances are a deviation from the norm. They are only displeasing to you because they represent a strong deviation from balance and require additional energy use. You are the one providing the source of energy when you create the obstacles and then you spend even more energy in overcoming them. By contrast, good fortune and feeling happy is the norm. We are usually only discontent when we come up against a deviation in the script. Whenever the mind spots a deviation from a script it has accepted, it automatically perceives the change in a negative light and expresses the corresponding attitude towards it. The mind then strives to bring the situation back under control in its understanding. So, now, explain the rules of the game to your mind. Tell your mind that it will still be in control, but that the function of control now consists in perceiving all events as positive. Switch on your guardian at the very beginning of the performance, at the beginning of the day. Normally, you have a rough idea of how the events of the day should unfold. In the moment that you see the scenario changing, you must accept the change and agree to them. You only perceive an event to be negative because it does not fit into your scenario. Pretend that the event is just what was needed. This way, you get a sliding and dynamic element of control over changes to the scenario. Do not rush to express your dissatisfaction or try to fight the situation just because ongoing changes are being introduced to the script. By giving up your control over the scenario, you have it returned to you only this time Control is aimed at going with the alternative's flow, rather than fighting against it. The secret to coordination lies in letting go your grip of control, at the same time as taking the situation into your own hands. When the mind keeps things under its tight grip of control, the situation cannot develop in harmony with the alternative's flow. However, when you accept changes to the script as par for the course, you let go of imposing your own sense of control. When you let go of the need to control, you actually become able to keep your own attitude and, consequently, the situation itself under control. At the end of the day, everyone wants to avoid problems and have everything turn out well in their life. If you begin practicing the principle of coordination, 
This is exactly what will happen. The coordination principle is even more effective than trying to influence events with the power of outer intention. The mind is incapable of anticipating perfectly every move that is to come. As we have already said, you are not alone in the world. The layer of your own world intersects with endless layers of other people's worlds who are constantly adding their own thing to the picture. And yet, the mind does not have to work out in advance what moves lie ahead. All it has to do is to run your target slide and follow the principle of coordination. Then, outer intention will successfully bring you to your goal. Coordination develops with practice. It is not enough to understand the coordination principle on an intellectual level only. You have to be constantly developing and perfecting the ability. Your guardian must be working constantly too. You must not be oblivious to the moment that you are being drawn into a negative game. Coordination is the most effective means of moving through the alternative's space. You perceive every event as positive, and so always move onto a favorable branch of your lifeline and more frequently encounter the wave of fortune. You must be careful not to end up with your head in the clouds. You are not meant to be floating in the air, but rather taking conscious, intentional action that enables you to balance as you ride the wave of fortune. This is the essence of Transurfing. Apples fall to the sky. As it is written in the Holy Scripture, according to your faith, be it unto you. There is so much truth in this line. You only ever receive as much as you are willing to receive. Whatever this is, outer intention will fulfill your orders impeccably. You have what you have because it corresponds to the template of your worldview and vision of your place in the world. Now that you are acquainted with all the main principles of transurfing, you can manage your fate according to your own free will. Your fate will be shaped to reflect your personal choices and beliefs. You know how to choose. That just leaves the question of how to believe in it all. As I have said before, you cannot convince the mind of anything until it is confronted with fact. The mind, however, is capable of pretending. It is also capable of blind, fanatic belief but usually a false belief based on intense excess potential created when inflated meaning is attributed to conviction. When the mind is absorbed with false belief, it becomes so deafened by its own fanaticism that it is incapable of seeing or hearing anything else. When the mind climbs into the box where it has stuffed the heart, belief is blind. The sail of false belief will never fill with the wind of outer intention. False belief is a trap that the pendulum sets in the labyrinth of insecurity. When you buy into a false belief, you might think that you have escaped the labyrinth, but this is an illusion. Deep down inside, you will be plagued with doubt, but you will not acknowledge them because you have put up a protective wall of faith that blocks them out. How can false belief be distinguished from true belief? True belief is more than belief. It is knowledge. A belief is false if you have to persuade or convince yourself of it, no matter what approach you take, enthusiasm or duress. Knowledge is shaped by facts, not conviction. When the mind is faced with a fact, it simply knows, whereas false belief is maintained by the mind's control. The mind makes absolutely certain that no trace of doubt can slip into its illusory room inside the labyrinth. 
When the mind wants to hope, it refuses to listen. When you try and convince yourself or try to believe in something, you run the risk of adopting false beliefs. And yet, when you begin to listen to the rustle of the morning stars, the illusions are revealed. Relax the mind's control and shift your attention towards being more attentive to the slightest signs of inner discomfort. If you reveal a pang of discomfort, step back from trying to convince yourself of the idea you want to adopt. When you achieve a state of unity of heart and mind, you will not have to convince yourself of anything. Neither is there any point in trying to talk yourself round with positive affirmations. Any doubts you feel will not disappear by repeating to yourself, I will have my way. On the contrary, this just creates fertile ground for the doubts to grow stronger. The heart will not be persuaded, however hard you try, because the heart does not understand logic or the language of the mind nor does it communicate in half tones. If you ask the heart, will I reach my goal? It will answer either yes or no, but never maybe or probably. If the heart feels the slightest shadow of a doubt, the answer will also be no. When the heart has doubts, there is absolutely nothing you can say to persuade it otherwise. So, what should you do? The answer lies in the statement above. The heart does not work with half tones. Doubt is what you experience when you believe in something to a certain extent, but not totally. The heart turns not exactly into absolutely not. It neither believes nor doubts. It simply knows what will happen and whether the answer is yes or no. You have to take the radical step of removing the word believe from your worldview template and replacing it with no. If the mind knows that such and such a thing is going to happen, the heart will agree without question. Do you believe that you are listening to this book? No, because belief does not come into it. You just know that you are listening it. Where there is belief, there is always room for doubt. Now that you have removed the notion of belief from your mind, allow yourself to have the knowing that your desire will be fulfilled. For the law has it that the goal will be reached if there is will to have and if there is the will to act by moving through the right door. It is your choice. You are in charge. If the decision is truly yours, any thoughts along the lines of what if it does not happen will become irrelevant. Any event can develop in one of two ways. It will either work out or it will not. It is pointless trying to convince yourself that something will work out, but when you have the knowing of the heart, you can determine the outcome. Knowledge is the foundation on which confidence is built. There is just one small step to go, which is how to acquire the knowing. To properly acquire knowing, you have to get used to it and accept it. With time, people get used to all sorts of incredible things. Telephones, televisions and aeroplanes. Have we not seen many examples of things that were thought absolutely incredible? Apply the slide technique. Harbor knowledge in your mind and look after it until outer intention makes it fact. Remember, the task is not to convince yourself, but to remind yourself of the knowledge that you will achieve your goal. Whenever you think about your goal, you will catch yourself being involuntarily drawn back into doubt and thoughts about how the goal might be achieved will inevitably creep back in. 
doubts will naturally creep up on you, but you have to fish them out of your mind and put them in their proper place straight away with thoughts that sound, I know success depends on my choice and I have made my choice, so why hesitate? If you do this, the doubts will gradually fade. Where there is knowledge without belief, doubt cannot exist. There is no need to set about eliminating them or battle against their presence, for this is a guarantee of defeat. You can, however, console yourself with the knowledge that doubts do not necessarily guarantee failure, although the road might just get a little bit bumpy at times. I want to emphasize that the most important thing is to remember that you alone decide whether you will achieve your goal or not. Remind yourself of this fact every time the doubts set in. I also draw your attention once again to the habit of forgetting and living a semi-conscious existence. New knowledge is easily forgotten and old habits run deep. Never forget that you are in charge of your own fate. I do not imagine that Jesus was particularly astounded when he walked on water. It must have been as natural for him as walking on the ground is for us. Other people would also be able to walk on water if they could be rid of the doubt, anxiety, and emotion connected with doing so. Sounds improbable. Yet the entire history of humanity is a continual chain of the surprising and incredible. For example, it was once said that iron ships will never float on water, let alone fly. And yet, as soon as people saw that they could cross the water in iron ships and fly through the sky in heavy aeroplanes, they ceased to contemplate the lack of probability that these things were possible. Dragging doubts around with you is a sure way of reducing your chances of success. There are two lifelines in the alternative space, one on the goal that is achieved, and on the other, you meet with failure. When you wallow in doubt, you radiate energy at the frequency of the line of failure, and then you can hardly hope for success. If encountered, Failure will be caused by circumstances that have appeared as a direct result of your own thoughts. The question needs to be put differently. Will it happen or not? Should be replaced by, what do I choose, success or failure? It can be difficult to get used to posing the question in this manner. Your entire life you have been convinced that apples fall to the ground and could hardly fall to the sky. However, if you can regularly catch yourself in the moment that you succumb to doubt and remind yourself that success is just a question of choice, you will soon get used to it. Imagine to yourself that, as of today, apples have started falling to the sky. It feels quite strange initially, but then you get used to the idea and accept it. What can you say? That is just what apples do. Is anyone surprised when balloons fly off and upwards into the sky? Now, wake up and look what I have just tried to convince you of with conscious awareness. Did you get the feeling that I might have been leading you into a labyrinth in search of belief? If you believed me, you fell into the trap. Do not be offended, dear listener. I only wanted to demonstrate how easily the mind falls into wandering about in the pointless labyrinth of belief. Our stroll began with the words, you have to take the pivotal step. Then we tried to substitute belief with knowledge that has not been obtained yet. However, that does not change the essence of the nature of faith. Pendulums do exactly the same thing when they are trying to win your faith and trust. Do not worry. 
Transurfing is not a trap for the mind, and everything I have shared in this book is more than a product of speculative exercise. Even our little stroll ceases to be a trap if you think about it from the point of view of hoping to obtain freedom, rather than calling you to believe. Only pendulums have a need of other people's faith. In the context of transurfing, winning people over so that they can hold a certain belief has no purpose whatsoever. My goal is not to convince you. My goal is to break through the stereotypes and false thought patterns of the conventional worldview in order to assist you in breaking out of the box of conditioning and waking up into the dream of waking. When you wake up, you realize that you can direct your own dream and without having to rely on belief. Take action and you will see what happens as a result. Do not believe, verify and prove and when you see that transurfing really works, you will then simply know. You have probably heard it said that you can achieve anything if you have unshakable faith in your own strength and victory. It is easy to say, according to your faith, be it unto you. But you cannot help wondering where this faith and strength of conviction is to be found and how doubts can be eradicated. In reality, you cannot avoid doubt and it is futile to try and acquire faith. If a shadow of doubt has crept into your heart, no act of persuasion will ever drive it out. You can only deceive the mind. The mind will pretend that it has forgotten all about its previous doubts, but they will continue to live in the heart as before. Abandon fruitless attempts to acquire absolute faith. There is another, more realistic way of dealing with doubt. Do not think about the means. Run the target slide in your mind and place one foot in front of the other in the direction of your goal. This exercise is not just another form of abstract dreaming. It consists of real work on attuning the energy you transmit. After all, your worst expectations are realized, are they not? So, make it a concrete task to consciously and deliberately reattune your energy towards realizing your best expectations. If you have a goal but doubt whether things will work out for you or not, your doubts will hinder your progress. You will not be able to discard them totally but neither is it necessary to do so. The mind looks for faith to help it confirm that the goal is realistic. Nonetheless, do not think about the means. Brush faith aside. Live out the slide that pictures your life as it would be were the goal already achieved. By practicing this exercise, you work on the quality of your energy without fueling it with conviction. Take pleasure in the task, then outer intention will do its work and apples will fall to the sky. When the mind is faced with fact, apples fall to the sky. The mind relinquishes its control and allows the fact to come to life. It does not matter whether the situation's development can be clearly seen or not. What matters is that the goal appear realistic to the mind. We live in a world where people do ride bicycles. If we were born into a world where everyone could fly, we would learn to fly too. I have already explained that when a person attunes the energy they radiate to their target lifeline, they activate the workings of outer intention. You turn the target slide around in your mind and practice visualizing the process. Whilst you are busy with these exercises, the wind of outer intention slowly and surely pushes the frigate of the material realization of your world through the alternative's space. 
opportunities begin to arise in ways you would never have suspected. Moreover, outer intention begins to direct your actions in a way that brings you closer to your goal. Note that sometimes it might seem as if circumstances are unfolding in a bizarre way. And yet, how could you know which road specifically leads to your goal? Would you expect to teach a top chef how to prepare a dish in their own restaurant? Always remember that the mind is incapable of anticipating all the moves that lie ahead and so cannot possibly know how to realize the goal. After all, it could not be achieved by ordinary means, could it? And there we go again, trying to crawl into Propristi's bed of stereotypes and false patterns of thinking. Leave the matter of the means and ways to outer intention. Trust the alternative's flow. You will act in a way that brings you to your goal, irrespective of your own will. This is how outer intention works. If, right now, you are walking to a job you hate through the mud and rain, but with a sense of the celebration of life in your heart, all the difficulties you are experiencing will soon disappear. Quite simply, the quality of your energy will no longer correspond to the frequency of the scene. I am not trying to convince you with these words, for there is no way out of the labyrinth of faith. I am just trying to inspire hope. There has to be hope that the walls of the labyrinth will crumble when outer intention demonstrates to you that apples fall to the sky. It is impossible to practice transurfing without this hope, and you would not have started it if you did not have hope. When there is hope, the mind feels firm ground beneath its feet, and the heart becomes vibrant. When people encounter misfortune and disappointment, or come up against a difficult problem, they give their energy away to pendulums and feel anxious, exhausted, and depressed as a result. People tend to get all psyched up and ready to battle with the situation, or they give up entirely. Neither position is very positive, and both lead to stress and depression. There is no calm in these states. The inner core of confidence is undermined, and people turn to cigarettes, alcohol, and drugs, etc., as a way out only to find themselves in bondage to new pendulums. You can always find strength inside yourself if you wake up and become conscious of how the situation was created in the first place. The problem was created by pendulums, and there is nothing wrong with this. The danger lies not in the problem itself, but in your relationship to it. If you accept the importance of the problem, you are giving your energy to the pendulum. It is important to be conscious of the fact that, in any difficult situation, the pendulum requires you either to tense up and fight, or to lose heart and succumb to despair. You must not do either, and yet, what can you do when there is no support and the inner strength of confidence has been lost? Support is found in the awareness that you know that the pendulum is trying to subject you to its will and feed on your energy. You might wonder how such simple knowledge can help, embolden, and give heart, but it can. Hope is also a kind of knowledge that not all is lost and that there is a solution. Understanding how a problematic situation works has the same weight as hope, for it puts you above being the puppet and the little paper boat. You now understand what is really happening, and you can consciously smile to yourself and say, No, Pendulum, you will not get your hands on my energy. I know what you are after and how you are trying to get your claws into me.
it will not work. You will not get me to buy into the importance of the problem. I have the right to choose, and I choose to be free of you. Everyone makes their mistakes in life which they later have cause to regret. You might think that you are too far now from your original goal to make it real, but nothing is ever lost. Transurfing can help get things back on track. Even if your previous goal is objectively speaking close to you now, you can also find a new goal. Everyone has more than one goal, and so, at any age, there is the chance to set a new goal, and the chance must be taken. The mistakes of the past serve as your capital. If you take this position, you will achieve shining success. Everyone who has achieved success has passed through a whole forest of setbacks and failures. There is a grain of truth in the saying that one man caned is worth two that were not, and failure breeds success. All prominent figures at the height of success have had to go through many difficulties in life. It is just that this side of their life is not particularly advertised. So, if you have made a big mistake and met with failure, be glad, for you are on the sure path to success. If you beat yourself up, whine, and complain about life, failure will repeat itself again and again. All the life experience that you consider worthless will undoubtedly benefit you in your target lifeline. Apathy dissipates when fresh hope emerges. Both animals and human beings who walk the desert to the point of exhaustion forget their wariness when they spot the oasis on the horizon. Picture the fly that beats itself against the window pane next to the open window. Its entire life, the fly has had it pummeled into its head that when you see a goal, you should fly directly towards it. And yet, the fly sees its goal and beats against the window pane in vain. It is the same with people when they fail to understand how to achieve their goal, deprived of choice and forced to accept the little they have. Now that you know that the open window exists, and it is just close by, even if you cannot see it yet, you will have hope. And where there is hope, the energy of intention is released. We need hope to begin taking action. Begin taking action and you will see that apples fall to the sky. When hope has done its work, you will become conscious of the freedom of choice. Then. You will say to yourself, I do not want and I do not hope. I intend. Summary Self-confidence is the same as a sheepish manner turned inside out. When you abandon importance, the walls of the labyrinth of insecurity crumble. Where there is freedom without struggle, Confidence is no longer necessary. When I have no importance, I have nothing to defend and nothing to conquer. Do not fight your response to provocation. Change your relationship to it. Be indifferent to losing and avoid setting yourself ultimatums. Treat all information with conscious awareness. You have freedom of choice. All you need is the will to have. Earn the will to have, not money. Concentrate on the goal as if you had already achieved it. The fact of personal choice is an immutable law. You shape your own reality. How not to be afraid? Find a safety net, plan B, or alternative route. 
How not to worry or get anxious? Act. How not to desire? Accept the possibility of defeat and act. How not to wait in expectation? Act. How to increase your worth? End the battle for self-worth. How not to get irritated? Play with the pendulum and break its game rules. How to be rid of feelings of guilt? Stop justifying yourself. How to deal with resentment? End the battle and go with the flow. If you cannot deal with your resentment, allow yourself not to be able to deal with it. Lifelines fork into positive and negative branches. You make your choice by expressing your relationship to the event that stands at the fork in the line. You step onto the positive branch of a lifeline when you intend to perceive apparent negative changes to the script as positive. Adopt the foolish habit of taking joy in setbacks. Switch control from battling against the alternative flow to going with it. Do not think about the means of achieving your goal. Turn the target slide in your mind and place one foot in front of the other in the direction of your goal. Live your slide where the goal has already been achieved. Then, outer intention will have its way and apples will fall to the sky.